And we are live. Good evening, good evening. It is Sunday, it is 8 o'clock, it is time for more Doctor Who. And this week we are doing the long game. Um, before we get into that, obviously uh, joining me tonight is Chris. Say hello, Chris. Hello, Chris. There we go. Uh, my son's not here this, yeah, my, my son's not here this evening, but uh, um, he's got something else on. But yeah, we're doing the long game this week. Before we get to that, uh, I want to talk about what happened this week. Uh, Ian's just joined us in the chat. Hello, guys. Hello, Ian. Uh, hello, Ian. Um, so what actually happened this week? Well, uh, I don't know if you did see it, but we had the big night in. And on the big night in, we had the nice little video from... It was, it was, a, it was a nothing video, really. But it was a, it was a nice little video for uh, the NHS... Uh, from 10 Doctors. And it was Tom Baker through to, uh, aside from Christopher Eccleston, through to Jodie Whittaker. Um, why Eccleston wasn't there, I don't know, but it, 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 was, it was a nice little video. And um, just, saying, just saying thanks to sort of the NHS and the frontline workers. And I, and I thought, it was, a, I thought it, was a, it was a nice little thing. A nice little moment. Um, so there was that. But also, we had Catherine Tate and David Tennant reunite in. For a sketch with her as um, I, can't, I can't remember the character's name. Um, no, it's gone. Totally blank. What but, character uh, was it? A Doctor Who character? No, no, no. It was uh, her. Uh, am I bothered? Oh right. Yeah, I know the character. I can't remember her name either. Yeah, but but it, it was it was probably the best thing on that night. It was it was literally probably the best thing on. Um, yeah, you did something right at the end last week uh, to highlight my text. Oh, God, you're right. I did. I can go like that. <laughs> also, uh, I haven't checked the banners. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me, Ian. As, uh, as, uh, let me check my banners here. I've got two banners. There we go. Um, but yeah, so it was a nice little sketch. It was um, a sketch whereby he was pretty much, he was the teacher, he was teaching from home, and he was doing the online um, classes, and he was trying to get through to her, and she was like on about the COVID-19 and social distancing and all that stuff, and, uh, it, and it was, it was literally, it was, there were two real good spots on, on the whole show, which is, Really not their fault because they were, you know, everybody had to film themselves. But it was it was kind of that and the return of Little Britain was probably the two best things on the entire evening. Um, so yeah, but anyway, um, we're going to be starting off with Doctor Who: The Long Game this evening. Um, let me just save this, and I can. Look at that. Look at that. We have the power. I can actually... Uh... <laughs> Don't have the capital T on there, though, do we? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, okay. So we, we, we can edit. We can edit. <laughs> we, can, we can edit live. Oh. There we go. And we can do that as well. <laughs> We have the technology, people. We have the technology. But, um, yeah, so this week we are doing the, the long game. And we've just fo following up from last week's episode, Dalek, which I think we're all pretty much in agreement of is possibly the best episode of Series 1. Except okay. for, um, I, I, it's not my favourite, but it's probably the best one. I mean, it, in terms in terms of in terms of writing, in terms of pacing, in terms of how it's put together, how it was shot. Um, and the one thing that we did overlook last week, and we, we covered, I think we covered the ins and outs of everything last week except for one really important thing, and that is the Dalek music, oh. written by Murray Gold, and the the orchestral score and the chorus. And the choir belting out. It's a musical score that sticks with the Daleks right the way throughout until the end of Capaldi's era. And it is such an important score 
Um, I mean, you've only got to, this is how good the, the score is for the, the Daleks. You've only got to hear a little bit of it to know exactly what's coming. And, you know, it, it, it happens in part in other ways. It happens in, you know, all, all the way up. Victory of the Daleks, the whole lot. It, 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 this, that piece of music. And Murray Gold is very, very good. He's like John Williams in a way. He's very good at assigning a theme to a person or, or to a thing. And then that would always remind you, you know. Um, I, I recently, I started watching, uh, I, I was watching, I, I, I watched, all of uh, the series two of Lost in Space, and you forget how good John Williams' score is. You know that it's it, how iconic that. Da, 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 da. And he does the same with Jaws. He does the same. With, but Murray Gold's done exactly the same thing with Doctor Who. You've got I Am the Doctor theme. You've got the Dalek theme. You've got Cybermen theme. You've got all these different yeah characters are assigned these themes, and. It was such an important element of making the Daleks for the return. Um, and I think that we should we should have acknowledged it last week and we didn't. So there we go. Um, I don't know if you've got any. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know if you've got any more that you'd like to add to that. But um, no, no, I can't believe we forgot it. Really, I mean, I, I know we've actually not really mentioned the score for all of this uh, while we've been doing it. I, I know, I know. Well, look, 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 there's there's things that we've we've talked about where we talked about the light dim, where we talked about um, that was that. I just died off my feet. Never mind. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we've talked about the light dim. We 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 have left Murray Gold a, a little bit. I think we've we've undersold him a bit, and I think that we, we he deserves a little bit more of a, a push from us. So perhaps um, we'll give him a. a a special 10 minute section when we get to the end of partner the ways yeah um yeah probably uh, let me just um there is something i want to do because i think we do that thank you nope oh, what have i done what oh, anyway i've got i've got a banner going across the hall if i click on banners here Edit. There we go. Uh, there. Thank you. It's in edit. That's, that's all. Um, comments. There we go. And I can hide that. Boom. There we go. Hey. So um, I, I said I could edit that live, and I haven't looked. Look, I've left it. <laughs> uh, um yeah so before we start we're going to talk about the episode itself what we remember about the episode and what was your first real memory of the long game there we go capital t <laughs> um well it was um it was billed as the uh budget saving filler episode weren't it but i, th I thought it was quite interesting at least at least back then they went into space and went into the future a bit. Oh, well, I weren't very far into space, but it was still in the future. <laughs> I want. I want. I've got to post this but one up from again. I can't think of a single piece, bit of music from series eleven or twelve that's anywhere near Murray stuff. Exactly. I, the, I can't. The, think. Only, the only point I would make about that is the two times they used the uh, the actual theme tune when the Doctor does something in the last episode. And the first episode with Joey. Yeah. Other than that, no, you're right. It's just, just and I, I don't think it's uh, Akinola's fault. I think he's just doing. He's just trying to compose themes that uh, that he thinks uh, fit the the visuals and keeping the producers happy. So, um, yeah. Um, what I would say about this episode of, of Doctor Who, um, the, I remember the first time I watched this episode, and I'm going to say something now, which. Mm, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's going to be like all the other episodes we've had. I felt like sort of these action shows, this adventure show. This is a uh, uh, you know chasing from uh, aliens or chasing from zombies. Or uh, this is the first episode where I felt it was Doctor Who, and it, it's kind of odd because it, if I had a, if I had a liking. 
the feeling or tone of this episode to anything, it would probably be Dragonfire. Um, it's a kind, of, it's kind of weird, but it's it kind of opens up in a similar sort of way. You know, he's taking this person around this sort of intergalactic supermarket. You know, and it gets things get caught up, and there's another mystery going on. And it, it, it very it felt very familiar to me. Um, I think this is also the first and uh, one of the only times really that Russell T. Davis has written something which I think is an actual jibe at uh, at, at a political uh, a political story because I think that that not often does he comment or try to comment on on what he, what he thinks, but this was a clearly an episode whereby he's saying he's kind of having a go at like Rupert Murdoch. And say, you know, if you don't believe everything you read, it's uh, very much a the media is controlling the narrative, and and therefore, you know, you, you shouldn't go along with everything just because the news says so. Um, also, I think the, the I I kind of feel like after last week's episode, which was a Ted Paul episode, this episode was again not really a bottle episode, but it was definitely. A money-saving episode. There were there's a lot of digital map work going on, with set extensions and things like that. Um, I think they try to they were trying to push into more of a integrating digital effects into the into the story. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I think it was it was very much a what can we do with as little as possible. I, I I would say as as part of the story, and we got you. Um, so look, yeah. Uh, I can actually show this. Boom. I was a bit dis- disappointed after Dalek. Um, I still think it's a good story. I think it's and un- I think it's understated. It, it, it it's a, a an understated story. Um, uh, didn't Russell submit this back in the eighties when he was very young? Possibly. Uh, I mean, that was at a time when, by where by you, you, know, you had the two big papers, where by you had sort of the Sun and the Daily Mirror, sort of battling it out. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, for me, this episode. The only thing I would say about this episode that I really don't like, and that is the Jagrafest itself, because it's one of those villains that doesn't work. And it doesn't work for a very obvious reason. You can walk away from it. <laughs> it's it, and it's supposed to be the big important bad guy, and it does it just that just simply because I I I I'd, I had done a Doctor Who I had written a Doctor Who story before ages ago. I've, I've written several. I used to when my son used to come over to write them for him for like bedtime stories. And uh, I remember writing something very similar to the Jagrafess. But the, the difference was that it was uh, it was on a building. It was it was on a, on like a top floor. Of this do you know, like the um, the CN Tower. It was like a, 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 up there, and it was isolated, and it was like a hotel, and the the, the creature itself was actually tendrilled through the building, so it would actually come up to the air ducts and things like that and pull people in. Whereas the Jagrafest is kind of just stuck to the ceiling. It, it, it's it's and the earlier the earlier if you haven't seen it by the way there's earlier concept art for the Jagrafess looks ten times better and more terrifying than what we end up with. Well, we'll have to pull it out and have a look afterwards. It's yeah because the the original artwork is far more graphic. It's more it's more like um like with this it's kind of like a blob of fat stuck to the ceiling with some teeth. Whereas the original concept art is just like these shards of teeth just coming straight down and just coming out the person. Like, did they um, um, did they show that in the Doctor Who Confidential? Remember when that was a thing? Yes, I think they did. I think they did. I think that's where where I actually remember it from. Um, but but yeah, it's it's a very it's much more graphic, and. Um, the only other thing I, I could think, really think about this episode was that I know there was um, a bit of excitement because Simon Pegg was in it. Um, and he had just done, I think he had just come off the back of Shaun of the Dead. 
um, before doing this. So he was kind of, he's kind of on his way up. Um, I've got to be honest, I, I, when, when, we can get talk about this a little bit more when, when the show goes on. But for me, I'm not a huge Simon Pegg fan. Um, he's good, he's okay, but uh, he's kind of Simon Pegg in everything. Um, I like him. I like. I love Hot Fuzz. Hot Fuzz, I think, is brilliant. And, and I'm not knocking him. It's just the fact that for me, it's you know, when he's Scotty in Star Trek, he's Simon Pegg playing Scotty in Star Trek, and it's. I, but uh, anyway, I, I haven't got any more to add unless you you've got something else to say before we can make make a start. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't know if you'd rather talk about it afterwards or not, but um, this uh, episode is notable for. One of, for a series first in Doctor Who, isn't it? Possibly. Well, do you want to leave it till afterwards, or do you want me to talk about it now? Because it's... talk about it now. Yeah, go for it. Well, this was the first episode where Companion was kicked out of the TARDIS. Oh, literally sacked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, again, they they deliberately done that so that that Adam was because they wanted. Like I think Russ D. Davis wanted a character, so you can see how how serious the Doctor was. Yeah. So he wanted a, he wanted a character that was very similar to the Doctor. Um, in many ways, because so because even the language being used when, when when Adam talks, he just says stuff like "Oh, fantastic," and it, he's got this sort of little bit of sort of boyish excitement about him. Um, so you can see why Rose likes him, but that gets cut off by the fact that this is what happens when someone like him is unsupervised and it isn't pulled back. We kind of, we kind of get to see a very similar character to Adam again in um, uh, in the Jadoon episode. Uh, not not Jadoon, um, Sontaran Stratagen. Yeah. Uh, we, get a similar, we get a similar character again where, whereby he has to be taken down by the Doctor. Um, but this you is, that- yeah... I totally understand why it's done in the writing, and I, I think it's that's one of the uh, one of the better things about the episode is like that 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 lesson learned. Like, yeah, you can go with a doctor. Yeah, but if you don't, we got to play the rules. It's not for your own personal gain. Yeah. And, yeah so yeah, it, 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 literally, this is the first time someone's literally been kicked out of the TARDIS. You know, I know companions have come and gone and what have you. Been yeah. they've, they've crashed spaceships into Earth and all sorts of stuff, but. No one's ever been sacked before, so yeah, that's, 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 that's the series first. Yeah. So we uh, should we make a start on the episode then? Yeah, go for it. Excellent. Right, I've got my BBC queued up, ready to go, and I'm gonna be pressing play in three, two, one, go. BBC. Here we go. I don't know how loud this is. Might be really loud. Solar flares. Um, Tardis, Tardis landing. They've got. See, this is proper, like sort of. Um, <laughs> this is a BBC set. Look at it. It's clearly a BBC Doctor Who sci-fi set. Look at it. Yeah, I mean, that that's straight from the straight from the eighties. <laughs> you just got like, like foam core balls on a silver stick and yeah. things with tin foil on. <laughs> Yeah, it's such a familiar feeling. Digital map again, like these these days, they would never do something like that because they I don't know maybe they they too they too good for it I don't know. There's one of a traveling shot. You you could kick that out in about two minutes. Shocking how, more, how far we've come in like 15 years. I'm not pushing my chart. No, this is the same set as uh, Linda with a white walked on, isn't it? Yep. Ha, <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> I don't. I don't even mind the, the the design of satellite drivers either. It's um, it's it's very, uh, it's very nineteen sixties retro sci fi design. But I I like I, I like that sort of thing. I'm I'm partial to those sorts of those sorts of things. I'll tell you what I have realised while we've been um, covering this series in particular. Yeah. There is how much I enjoyed Murray Gold's version of the uh, theme tune. Yeah. Oh man, look, look, I I think it goes absolutely banging when uh, the upgrade if on the I think it's the Christmas special with uh, David Tennant, they make it a bit more rock theme, add a bit more more drums. There we go. See, <laughs> I, lo I love this, right, because this is all about creativity and imagination. And if you look at it, there's, there's really not, all these people are banging into each other. There's really tons of room. If the camera pulls back, when they show the, the far back shot, you can see that these people are literally got to stack the room around because there's yeah. just this one bar. But again, it's, it's just you film what you need to film. I think what I like with this episode as well is that there are some good ideas, like some really good sci-fi ideas. Eggleston's so good at rattling off those lines, isn't he? Yeah. Hey, you know something wrong? Ah, uh, there she is. Christine Adams. She, I, I tell you what, she is someone I think deserves to be in some sort of uh, sci-fi hall of fame. She's, she's an amazing... I mean, she should be at every Comic Con. She's been in absolutely everything. Um, for some reason, I always see her as a Bond girl. I don't know why. Yeah, I can, I can see that. She, she, she's always seemed to me to be. I mean, she is just stunning. But she, like, I mean, after this, she done Batman Begins. You know, and then she then what was it, Terra Nova? Um oh. I mean, Terra Nova didn't go very well, but uh now she's doing uh, Black Lightning. But for, yeah, for some reason I always envisioned her as a Bond girl who was just I I could just see her in a in a stinky dress walking on with the with a gun. A lot of what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah, it could be that I'm just a pervert. Yeah, this is entirely <laughs> possible. Um, there we go. Better. Yeah, no, no, actually, she's absolutely, and she's next to, I can't remember the actress's name. Is it Anna Martin? I haven't, I haven't got any notes on this whatsoever. I don't know, it's all I care for. Did I make a note of it? Let's have a look. Oh, I have got some. Well, I've got some notes. I've got some internet. I, th I think it's Anna Martin. I think she's because um, she was in. Um, I remember in Good Old Months. Right. She did a lot of Shakespeare and stuff. Suki is Anna Maxwell Martin. Yep. And uh, Kathy Curry is Christine Adams. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, we'll forget. Like I said, she she's one of those actresses that that is. Uh, she does the rounds. She, I mean, she was in Tron Legacy. She's been uh, just. She's done everything. You, you know, she's done. She done. She was in um, Agents of Shield. She was in all sorts of stuff. And she's done. See, so she's done DC, Marvel, 
CW, Tron. I mean, she's she is a staple of the the, the comic book universe. Ah, you see, he's starting to he's starting to put things together. Things that go. He's, he's he's already starting his deviousness. Underhanded, dastardly schemes. There it is. Oh, da -da -da -da. I so I do find this concept a little bit weird. I, mean, I don't think this, it was ever really fully explained why people have to be frozen. I understand why the floor has to be cold. I just don't understand why they have to be frozen. Maybe there's an explanation that I've just missed. Well, the evening will tell us. <laughs> She's just a fantastic striking woman. But, I mean, cracking, cracking cast for this episode. Yeah. Well, I mean, pretty much most of the first series was like that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Get Susanna and Trini soon. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 interesting setup here. And, again, interesting sci-fi ideas. That's looking a bit ropey now, isn't it? I don't know, actually. That doesn't look as bad as I was thinking it was going to be. It's not great. It's it's, yeah. it's okay. If you don't if you don't if you don't focus on it too much, it, it, it's okay. I don't think it's too bad. It's not wibbling about on her head, you know. It, it, no, no, no. It's 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 they they, they, they tracked it well. It's not a rubber frog, Carly. It's a bit, but I mean, like the, the, you see where they've saved money on this statue, like with like with the the, the posts that they stand in behind, yeah. a fence. It's literally just like two, three floating fences. It's a very cheap set. You know, those those fences aren't even bolted to the floor. They. And it, and this as well. These are all. These are all very, very cheap, uh, cheaply put together sets. Because if you, when you when you see the full pullback of this room, you realise that there's like literally only two working monitors, and all the rest are just static pictures. Yes, it is. But as you see. The thing I like with this is that, like, as he says, the technology is wrong. Um, the, the gimmicks that they have in this episode that are a little silly, stupid ideas, which you know would probably be marketable. Yeah, if you look at all the screens there, then you'll see that the lights are dimming up and down on them, but they, they're basically just static pictures stuck to the wall. Being backlit. Don't want to shatter people's illusions, but... Lucky, lucky you with your promotion. <laughs> but I mean, I love these basic, simple designs. I just really like it. I just like how 
they're telling these stories without having to go and and just waste a ton of money building extravagant looking sets. I, I like the fact that he's written in it so that he's sort of telling her stuff that she experienced when she first was in the future. Yeah. So she, he's he's sort of like telling her things that she can identify with, but it's clear that he's not sincere about it. No. No, the word you're looking for is manipulative, followed by a swear word. <laughs> Now, uh, that, I'm wondering, no, I, I, I think I've got this wrong here, but in, I've got a feeling, in Bad Wolf, they use the same doorway, but I think they use the walls from the previous room with the spike for the execution room. Oh, I'll have to wait until we watch it again. It's been such a long time since I've seen it, mate. Yeah, yeah. I know the scene you mean, but I can't picture the uh, yeah. decor. I, I thought it was the same room as this, but I don't think it is. I think it, it's the same door, but I think they've changed the walls to the, the those double light walls. Everybody's dead, Dave. <laughs> We're now arriving at level Christmas. I, I, I've got to be honest, I do love those doors as well, because they, they don't look safe at all. They've, all got the <laughs> They've always got a permanent spike sticking down, which doesn't even go up out to, out, out, out of view. It's always in scene, so it, it, it just looks like it's going to come down and slice you in half. It's nasty, but it's very simple design tricks that they just make things look uncomfortable, nasty. Because even in the future, polythene is a thing. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what the art department have done done with it though. It's like they just sliced it, cut it into ribbons. There does not have been quite so much hype about Simon Pegg and that with this. I mm -hmm. think if I'd have seen this the first time, I'd have been suspecting Cybermania. Um. Because of all the polythene. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Aye. But again, it, it is very Dragonfire though. In 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 the setup in the. You know, go to this other floor again with all the plastic. Companions running around. I do like the way that the, these sets are done, though, because it's very, very cheap and very cost effective and very, very inventive. Yeah, it works. Yeah, I, I don't understand that either. Why, why couldn't somebody have cleaned that, cleaned that up?
Yeah, I, 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 again, I am got nothing against Simon Pegg, but this is Simon Pegg with bleached hair and blue contacts. And he can, he can, he says things convincingly. But he's still just Simon Pack. Like, like, shoot, 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 shoot. <laughs> Pull the trigger. Shoot. <laughs> shoot, 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 shoot. Exhaust the tap. It's just a bit late now, isn't it? I, I don't get that. Why, why wouldn't you run? Or oh, walk, walk. Walk would have been good. Walk would have been good enough. There it is. Yeah, see those light panel walls? Yeah. I'm pretty sure that that's those are, are what are in the corridor. I believe they just reused from there. No. Again, it's this whole narrative of slow manipulation by the media, of keep repeating. It's a very Donald Trump thing, isn't it? Keep, keep repeating. I don't want to get political, but you keep repeating something, and and hopefully long enough people keep stop believing it. It's true. I'm gonna have a cup of bleach when this is finished, mate. Oh man, <laughs> I've been I have been aching. My my sides have been aching all day. I've been laughing so hard. Because I, I don't know if you hear the news this today, but he refused to take a pe uh, press conference earlier because because people were laughing at him. That's what it boiled down to. And I, I was like, this guy's a world leader. Come on. I honestly, I, I I've been laughing all day. <laughs> and then when I saw the SNL sketches, I that, that was that was gold. He was just being sarcastic, remember? Yeah, yeah. He was just being an imbecile. That's the worst part, is he can't, can't, can't admit that you, you're just wrong. You made a mistake. That's all you had to say was, I made a mistake. And then it would have just all blown over. Mm, Tamsin Greg. 
first time I ever saw Tamsin Greg in anything was uh, a show called Green Wing. Uh, yeah. I was trying uh, to think. For me, was it the Green Wing or Black Books first? I can't remember, but it was one of them two. Yeah, Green Wing came first and then Black Books. <clears throat> but she was in Green Wing with another Doctor Who alumni in Michelle Gomez, who played this manic, perverted, just... I don't know what what I don't even know what to call her. She was a pervert. Uh, that's all I, I can say. Michelle Gomez was this absolute psycho. Um, so not that she's typecast or anything. <laughs> no. I mean, to, some of the sort of thing with Tams and Greg. She's always Tams and Greg. Like she's very very good at what she does. And she's very dry. I mean, I, I would say that she's she's always her delivery is always dry, dry sarcasm. Could you imagine a double act television chat show with uh, Tasmin Gregg and uh, Clive James as the hosts? Oh mate, I'd have been so dry you'd have had to pour water on the telly. <laughs> but that's all she is like dry sarcasm all the time, and she, and she's really really good at delivering it. I mean, do you ever watch her in episodes with Matt LeBlanc? No. Oh, my. Just on fire. But yeah, there's, there's lots of little ideas that I like with this. Um, with, with what goes on in this episode in particular. But this, this whole thing with the ice cube that's that, uh, about to happen. Is one of those little things that it, it just builds this world a little bit more. Again, very simple sets. This is just probably just a reconfiguration of the the previous the spike room set, where they've just moved the walls around, changed the color uh, gels for the lights from a warm white to a cold white to make it look more sterile. Got a few diagrams of brains. Yeah, and it's literally and it's all backlit graphics as well. So this literally just pop it off a printer. Again, very limited, very limited uh, kind of set, very simple. It's been very well dressed. But you can see there, those are all the, all the screens that you can see working there are all just working screens. Everything else is just a backlit graphic. Do you know the individual episode budgets? So it depends on um, it depends on how the, the show is line budgeted. So you wouldn't necessarily have an individual episode budget. You'd have a seasonal budget. So which works out about the same. It, it works out about the same over the entire series. So you, you say say this was thirteen episodes, and you'd say all right, okay, so this costs say fifteen million pound for the season season one. So you'd say there's oh, okay, so it's about 1.1 million per um, per episode. But what you would do is then you'd like when you had to build the TARDIS from scratch, you'd build that to the entire series as opposed to just one episode because you're going to be using it across the series. So that that's how line production budgets work. So for this episode, and again, this they're going to reuse these episodes in later one, uh, the, the sets in later ones. Um, but yeah, you, that's, that's kind of how a line budget works for a, a show like this. You add up the cost of every episode and then just split the cost over, over the series. 
I mean, that's how you'd save money to make a, a more expensive episode next time, is that you, you, you save money in this episode and spend it in the next one. And obviously you have to save a few pence for the finale, don't you? Well, again, that, that's... Uh, I mean, again, we, they did a similar sort of thing with Dalek, whereby they were shooting a lot of stuff on Dalek in a... just on, on location. So... Yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of budget saving going on in this, but it it, it, it works all out the same across the entire series. So this episode was just as expensive as the next episode, even though they saved money in this one and spent more on the next one. <laughs> it's just that's just the way it works out. Balancing the books, I believe they call it. Well, it's just, it's just, it's like having it's like having a Chinese. You know, you, 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 all, you all chip, you, you, all, you all have a Chinese, when you go with your mates, you all have a Chinese, and you just split the cost of, of, of what was the bill. It's exactly that. I like the way she said it and actually didn't do it. Uh, yeah, I mean, Christine Adams, oh my word. She, uh, she is absolutely fantastic. In everything I've seen her, seen her in, she's been absolutely on fire. And I guess she, she was memorable enough. That's a lovely bit. Where he just touches it. And it flexes. Yeah, so I don't think that looks too bad still. It's just, it isn't awful. It works. Uh, I'll just scroll down. My ship would not look like that. Yeah, lots of lots of reusing sets. Again, this this simple match shot, very very simple, easy enough to do. They wouldn't do it these days because it, because of that reason, and I I don't get it. dead but it can still move like that again it's, it's a very old Doctor Who idea isn't it yeah this line that he's about to say now took approximately 23 takes yeah I remember it he absolutely could not say it <laughs> uh, 
Got your monkey's guiding light. Yeah. Oh, tw approximately 23 takes. He could not say it. He couldn't remember it. But it, here we go now. We've cut to a different um, location. And it's instantly recognisable as a different location. Purely based on the fact that they've just changed the light. Yeah. You know, the, the, the light in the editor's room is red. Uh, in blue. In here, it's it's red. In the spike room, it's warm white. In the surgery, it's cold white. So it's just really, really clever art direction. Make Donald Trump. <laughs> I think this is the first time the Doctor has really been tough as well as a, as sort of a tough guy Doctor Yeah, again, great dynamic music. Changes to Weasley music. Blob. See, it's a clever bit of writing here with uh, Russell T. Davis. You know, with the editor, he represents a consortium of banks and you know, bankers, lawyers, and he's just applied to that very much. My mother wouldn't know what white noise was and she'd wipe it anyway. You automatically know things are going wrong. Especially, I've never, ever, 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 ever downloaded something with enough information to make my phone glow. Yep, it's all gone sideways. What is the Daleks long game plan at this point? Uh, they are currently abducting people and making Daleks out of them. So at, at this point, they are seizing control so that they can manipulate things to hide the fact that it's taking all this time to kidnap people and make them disappear and they can bury it in news because they're not strong enough to take over so really what they're doing is hiding the fact that people are oh there we are 
doesn't it actually? Show, I don't think it ever shows what next to the key, but there we are. But yeah, if oh yes, yeah, just floating there, like. But yeah, I, I I think when when they when the darts reveal really plan, they are they've been stuck in the world uh, in the darkness for hundreds of years. So the, the manipulation has been for hundreds of hundreds of years. Oh, well, they, they, they normally just, they win enough of them. If you, if, so let me just put this up on the screen, actually. So, uh, yeah, uh, Ian just said, that, no, they normally just kill you, though, and not uh, set that, send up uh, groups of bankers and stuff. They weren't strong enough. If you remember, they, was, they were scavengers, and there was only a few of them left. I think there was only one, in fact, and he, he's, he's actually grown an entire Dalek race out of... Uh, sifting through, so they weren't they weren't strong enough to just take over. They they, they put a plan in place to put the Jagrafess in and uh, control the, the situation, so they could control humanity long enough, so they would walk in and willingly sacrifice themselves. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Scavengers, scavengers with business loans. Um, well, again, I don't think they they themselves uh, they control the consortium. But the consortium has the loans. I, I I don't think that they play the Daleks. The Daleks should tell them what to do. They're the people in control. You know, it's, it's kind of like the government and the Bank of England. You know the the. The government's in charge with the Bank of England, the one with the money and the, and the loans. This bit I don't like with um, Suki. Because, like, she's dead. She's just dead. Is she dead though, or is she dead dead? She's dead dead. I I mean, she's dead, dead, dead. Residual energy. <laughs> Bad time for a good morning setting. I'm not going to complain about the camera angle, though. <laughs> but again, lots, lots of really good little sci fi ideas in this story. At least for, for what they call a budget saver episode, I think they've done a, a great job with it. Yeah, there's all there's all sorts of things going off, like uh, the the dry ice jetting up there in the background just to fill some space, and all these little things, fans going around through light dim, and you've got the hazard lights there, and just all little small things just to fill space. And you can see how pissed the dark is. There we go. In you go. There's a, bit, a little bit of clever edge in there.
feel. <laughs> So yeah, apparently it's a sequel novel with this character. <laughs> and that's the end of that. Next week's episode then is Father's Day. It is indeed. So, now that you've seen the episode again, thoughts? Well, now the thing is, when I when I watch these episodes with you, mm -hmm. because of the stuff that you point out, I spend a lot more time now looking at the um, looking at the lighting, looking at the dressing of the sets and, and stuff like that. So I'm kind of watching them with very different eyes to when I watched them in 2005. And yeah. I think I've probably probably only watched them two or three times since then. Mm -hmm. So so of course now I'm, I'm with more of a uh, an eye to what's 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 going on on the screen as opposed before i was just getting caught in the story yeah so so yeah that's and and going on that with the different changes and the way they've moved the walls around and the lighting and that that's actually a lot better than i remember the jaguar's fed still look rubbish but other than that it's it is honestly it's a very clever uh, clever way of, of doing set it's very theatrical because quite often, quite often when you uh, are on on stage, you don't have a lot of room backstage. So normally you'd you'd have like um, like uh, I done a show with Sweeney Todd, and one of the sets for Sweeney Todd was built so that it was or built on a box, so that you had four different sets by just rotating the box around, and then the the actual barbers was on top of the box. So you, you had sort of five different sets then, and then when people would disappear into the, in, after they had their throat cut, we disappeared down inside the box, so you couldn't see them. So it was, it was kind of a, but this is that same sort of, similar sort of thing. It's, uh, it's a way of multiple uses of, and how you can change a set as well, because it was the same set for the surgery as it was for the spike room, and all they, literally all they did was just change the lighting gels. And it, it it goes to show how just changing the color palette of a room changes the entire set, just changes the entire feel of it. Um, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm I'm literally um, watching watching the whole thing now rather than just the story because I mean, this, and as I've got a, I've got a mate, and I know both my boys. This winds them up chronically. I tend to watch stuff to be in, uh, entertained. So, like the last couple of series of Game of Thrones, for example. Yeah, they were rubbish compared to the early series, but they did some set pieces I wanted to watch. So I just switched off and watched it for what it was, rather than getting all upset about it. And I yeah. think that, that's that's the difference. When we sit and watch these now, I'm watching them more analytically, um, looking more at the backgrounds and the little bits that I wouldn't have seen before. Yeah, I th and I think, well, because uh, what you can always do with any TV show, it's easy enough to just dismiss any TV show for being crap. It, it, and, and it is. Normally, you start off with good writing, and then how it's put together then depends entirely. Because you could have totally, you could have taken that exact same story, and you could have filmed it completely differently without changing one line of the dialogue. You could have cha changed the entire look of that show, that episode, or filmed it entirely differently. You could have, you could have built all different sets. You could have built all different. You could have done all different makeup. The Jagger Fest could have looked completely different to how it looked in the episode. You could have done all that, but it wouldn't have changed the story. Yeah. And what happens when when you get a story like this is that the creativity comes not out of of the writing for for the set for the set pieces. The creativity comes on telling exactly that story and leaving the audience fill in the blanks. Yeah. And you, know, you give them enough information, like for example, 
like when they, when they first land if you look at the scene where they first land and you've got the the, the booth in the middle with all the shops in it's literally one block uh, and about three shops all the all the panels open up and all the things there's about three shops and there's literally it's supposed to make make it look like this busy environment but if you look at how, how busy the environment actually is i think there's about 12 to 15 people i really don't think there's it's that they got that many extras for for that scene um i think overall the actors are that's what yeah we got um adam um uh, christine adams Anna Martin, uh, who else is there? Julie Holt, um, Rose, the Doctor, and Burger Guy, the the, the guy selling the Crunk Burger, and Simon Pegg, and everybody else. The extra, so that's eight people. Oh, and uh, Adam's mum. So we we've got maybe nine people in the entire cast. Um, so, yeah, not, not the most expensive of episodes, but they've, they've spent the money well. Um, okay, yeah. No. Um, uh, there we go. Okay, yeah. Back in the day on Gallifrey Base, there was a theory that Adam, very angry now, would suddenly become Davros. And, um, yeah, I remember that. I do actually remember that as a theory. It was, um, I didn't, I didn't mind it as a theory either. Because he was like, ah, okay, I, I can see where they're going for it. It's the whole hole in the head thing where by you say I in and stuff like that. I, I can understand that. It's just the fact that Davros is from Scarrow. And the Doctor is from Gallifrey. <laughs> and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let that one stand. Um so yeah, I yeah. If we went for the fact that I that Davros is from is from Scarrow, um I, I can see that theory working, in a way. Um, there's there's other things they could do with the character, though. There's plenty of other things they could do with the character. Um, because one of the things again, we talk about all these little things that they could do with the show. We I mentioned before, like I'd love to see Van Staten coming back, um, and working with like people like Lenny Henry's character. But there's also other consortiums where people like this could be recruited like 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 an anti torchwood yeah you know if you know, it's, it's like having the justice league and the, the the hall of doom you know it's it it's kind of that sort of thing but there's no there isn't one with doctor who and i i i, I wish there was it'd be, it'd be kind of cool um but but overall, like for for this episode, this the, the narrative of this story, I mean, I don't think any time they've done a, a story whereby the press is controlling things, I don't think that's ever gone down well. I mean, I I, I watched um, Tomorrow Never Dies, the, the the other day with you know the James Bond film, and that's a similar sort of thing. It's a story about um, a R Rupert Murdoch type character wanting to rule the world of media. Um, and it just they never i don't think they've ever sat well with the audience and, and it's you know tomorrow never dies it isn't that bad of a bond film all things considered um it's just got you got a, a kind of a khaki poo bad guy and what makes this bad guy again for me what makes the bad guy worse in this one is the fact that it just can't go anywhere it's stuck to the ceiling i don't even know why it's the ceiling I, I, I don't know what's so special about up there as opposed to maybe why, why, why would it be any different if it was down there i, I don't get it i'll, I'll tell you mean? what if, if i'd have written this mm -hmm. that thing wouldn't have existed i would have had a medical condition as to why simon Pegg needed the cold and i would have had him as the sole bad guy um i think what i so I, it's my understanding that the reason why russell t davis didn't want um simon Pegg to be the actual bad guy was because he always wanted the bad guy out of the way that he wanted the main villain to be untouchable so he wanted it's kind of like dealing with the 
the the head lackey, you know. Um, and I, I I think that's what he wanted. And uh, again, there's many other ways that they could have done this episode where it, they could have totally changed it. Uh, but you just still ended up with the same story. So, and I think I, you know, overall, I think I think it still works. I think that it still feels to me, it still still feels very classic Doctor Who. Out of, out of all the ones that we've had for series one, this is the one that feels like what we get next week with Father's Day, and after that, then we get the Empty Child and the Doctor. That they're great episodes, but they 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 they, they have a different vibe to them. This this one definitely vibes of classic era. Maybe it's the money saving techniques. Maybe it's the sets. Maybe I don't know, but it's... yeah, I, I, I think I think it's the um, I think it's the sets and the way they've 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 done the supporting cast. It does feel very. Um, no, I, I kind of get a, a kind of fifth Doctor era type vibe out of it. Yeah, it's again, it's again you're very um, yeah, po polythene balls on wire and. Called it set dressing. Um, it's, let me just have a look here. And what I'm actually looking for now is actually the concept art for the Jagrafess. Um, where is it to? I just want to have a quick look at it because, yeah, I, I mean, they, they could have gone with a better concept for it uh, yeah that's that's the thing I, I, I liked in the episode whereby it was like they were announcing that the face of Boward uh, is pregnant again <laughs> yeah, well while you're you're looking at that to answer what um, Ian said on that question there just I, looking I, on one of these these information sites. Apparently, he'll, um, Adam Mitchell will later resent the Doctor for kicking him out of the TARDIS. He had an ulterior motive beyond personal gain when he applied to cash in on future technology, wishing to save his alien mother with its advanced medical capability. It's due to the antiquated technology of the 21st century. His mother soon died and left Adam alone, seeking revenge on the Doctor and every companion whom he regularly travelled across different incarnations. And that's uh, the comics... Mystery day and the choice. Apparently, I haven't seen them. So, ah. uh, again, it, it makes sense. But the, again, what happens with Adam is the fact that the, the the character isn't forthcoming. Yeah, that's that's really the the problem with the character is the fact that, that had had he just asked, maybe things would have turned out differently. Well, yeah, I mean, that what I've just read is clearly what they call these days extended universe stuff or extended canon, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of like, um, you know, you get these extra stories you now with uh, Lady Christina D'Souza and, and things like that. So it's... Where the hell... Um... No, trying to find the early pictures of the Jaguar film. I, I'm, yeah, just trying to find the actual concept art that they had for it. It's a lot more. It's a lot more horrific. For one. Um. Well, there's there's actually a thing where it says Doctor Who underrated villain of the week. No, I don't think so. I don't. I don't think. I don't think it is. <laughs> I. I think it, it. It could have been. It could have been a great villain. But again, you can't. How if you can walk away from something, at a casual pace, because it's stuck to the ceiling. I don't think that's that's good. No, I, I can't see it anywhere. I I know I I know I have seen it though, because it, it was it was all sorts of reds and purples and lots of teeth. Yeah, the only one I can see on here is um is some sort of weird 
mechanical creature. And that's just, uh, I don't even know what that's supposed to be. <laughs> I mean, it's just, just this, this horrible sort of blob in mouth. Um, yeah, it's. But never mind. Anyway, that's. It's a shame we can't find that. It would be nice to show people. Um. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the thing just looks like a, a giant zit, doesn't it? <laughs> it? It's... The CG the CG for the Jagrafest wasn't that bad, mind. I, I'll, I'll give them that. It's a bit glossy and a bit... Uh, <coughs> and a bit sort of... Um, it, well, it's, it's very CG heavy because it, it was an entire CG character. They were, they were experimenting with that at this time, so... Yeah, I mean, I, 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 my initial thought of it was um, it looked like it was a bit too runny and, and watery and it was moving a bit yeah. too fast. But then when they explain about keeping the temperature down and that sort of thing. Um, just sweat in. Yeah, yeah, it's more like sweating. So, they, you know, it come across. And I think I think the bit with the um, everyone needing to be dead on that, um, on that computer system, they didn't really explain that, did they? No, not, that's, not that's the thing. It was it was kind of like um, again. I, th I think that's why it reminds me of things like um, Ice World, because you know the the, the, the people are zombie ice people, and, and it, it doesn't really explain that either. You know um, how it how lowering the temperature lowers people's will and things like that maybe. Um, but it was yeah. It's one of those things whereby, and again, it's that part where she she's dead and she grabs his leg, and I'm like, oh really. Because there's other things that they could have done with that. She, she didn't. Maybe she, she, she could have still been alive and she just sacrificed herself. But there's, there's other ways of playing it. Um, there's just choices. But it's, it is very, for me, it feels the most classic out of out of all the uh, new who cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that that bit with the uh, the dead body grabbing the leg. Mm -hmm. That is. That's the only bit of poor writing in this episode, actually. I think the rest of it sticks together pretty well. It, it again, it, it, it's pretty good. I, I like again. I, I'm not gonna have a problem with with watching Christine Adams uh, at all. Um, she's got a strong character. Um, you've got Tamsin Greg, who just again, she doesn't really really do anything um, incredibly deep with her characters. She always delivers the sarcastic, dry sarcasm, um, but she always nails it. She, she's, all, she's always smack on the money. Um, everything that she says is absolutely 100% convinced, believable, um, and as, as ridiculous as it, as it is. And what I think works with that is that everything's a matter of fact. You know, how come you don't know this? Do you know what I mean? Like... Of course, you cough it up of, of, of an ice cube. That that's how stuff works. What even in Brazil, it's, it's kind of like that's that's her sort of approach to it. And um, yeah, she she does a, I mean, she's always good in everything. Again, she she was great in Green Wind. She was great in Black Box. Uh, she was great in episodes. So um, yeah, it, it's just uh, am I missing somebody? I don't think I am. Huh? Uh, Anna Martin. Uh, Anna Martin um, played probably the most important character in the episode, really, as you know, as being sort of this because she was the the character that the editor was looking for before finding the Doctor, and she was the the spy double agent, whatever. She gets elevated, and then she ends up killing the editor as well at, at the end. So this is sort of a she finally achieved a mission by dying, I guess. Um, but again, she's not... Uh, she's done so much work, and it's all stuff I haven't seen. Like, if you look at her IMDb page, it's, it's like 50 jobs long. And it's like, I, I've seen good omens, and that's about it. All the rest of it is like, 
Honestly, there's nothing wrong. Like, I think the the only thing I remember seeing that I advertised of hers was um, the Frankenstein. I can't remember what it's called. Frankenstein Mysteries or something like that. It's called. Is that the one with Sean Penn? She plays Mary Shelley. Yeah, was that the series with Sean Bain in? I don't know. It's like four episodes long. It is. It's not. Oh, maybe it's not. Maybe I'm thinking there's something different. Yeah. But the thing is with her, I, I, I couldn't tell you anything else she's been in. I haven't seen Good Omens, and you know I don't watch a lot of shows anymore. But yeah. she's got a very familiar face that I know I've seen her in stuff because I recognise her. Well, that, that's the thing. The first time I, I saw her, I, I immediately went, oh, probably EastEnders. But no. It, uh, and when I've looked at her stuff, it's, it has literally been like, she's played Shakespeare, Shakespeare, more Shakespeare. And, and it's been for TV productions. It's just like, oh, I, I, I've missed all of these. <laughs> I, feel, I, know, I mean, I mean, I mean she in um, things like period drama, like stuff like Downton. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, uh, my other half would probably be able to uh, <laughs> say, oh, yeah, I know who she is, because she watches them sort of programmes a lot. So The way I understand it is that she's got this very... Um, when, when she normally plays stuff, she plays it... She's got a couple of different ways of, of performing, and when she's done doing the period stuff, she can be a bit more plumb-in-the-mouth-spoken, whereas... Other times, then she's just being this sort of really sort of down to earth Cockney, and then so she she has got this. So it's very difficult to sort of pin. Like even if you were to see her in something, she's kind of like if I were to put a, a, a character label on her, I'd say she's probably kind of like a a, a lady version of Gary Oldman. Yeah, yeah, I can see I can see where you're going with that. Yeah, even if you did like see her in something else, there's no guarantee you would know it was her anyway. You know, so it's I, yeah, I, I, the sort of actress that could start a sense going, all right, mate, and finish going, if I say, you know, yeah, so yeah, exactly. And and she's she, she's for, like what she's a bit more, um, because the character she plays in Good Omens, um, she plays a demon, um, and she's um, uh, basically a judge that is judging David Tennant's character. And is gonna uh, have him executed, and who she's in, like she I think she's in like three episodes, and her character is she's like pestilence or something like that. She is she's just like this real, I mean she's not even salt of the earth like she she is just the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she's she's very good in it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think like of a, a other have, have we missed anyone? I think we covered covered Bruno Langley last week and the disappointment that was. Um, thanks for that, Ian. Oh. <laughs> right, what do you want? Work me way down the cast list. Oh, well, I don't think we've got anybody else. I don't think there is anybody. I think 12 people is maximum. Well, the listed <laughs> cast, the listed, the listed cast we've got is Dr. Who, yes. Rose Tyler, Adam, Head Chef, yeah. Africa, Suki, the editor, Nurse, and Adam's mum. That's that's the cast list on the uh TARDIS wiki. Yeah, there's there's really not not anybody else. No. Um. So yeah, I mean, look, Christopher Eccleston does again. He did a fantastic job in this. Fantastic. He did a fantastic job in this, whereby he's able to rattle off the dialogue, and some of the dialogue is, um, I think was was good with Russell T Davis's writing in this. By by the way, he is communicating it. To an audience, and I know this is one of the tropes of writing for a companion, but he's conveying the techno babble, the environment, and everything, and he manages to whittle it right the way down to just going on holiday. Yeah, you know, and and the way that he's able to rattle the, those lines off, um, and I, I I like the fact that I know we're maybe mentioning in the episode whereby he's playing the tough guy doctor, and it's really. You don't see that over the doctor very often. So the fact that he is playing this leather jacket wearing, you know, rebel without a cause kind of vibe, we're willing to willing willing to punch somebody in the face. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, and that sticks sticks with it, how he plays the character very, very well throughout the episode, particularly when he gets absolutely um, <clears throat> cheesed off with Adam. <clears throat> you know, he sort of walks up to him, grabs him behind the neck and just throws him into the TARDIS, you know. It's like, you know, in, out, get... And, and he's just no nonsense. Cuts through all the... Um, the only thing I would say about that scene that I don't like about that scene is Rose having fun in that moment because the doctor's been very very serious and she starts having fun and she she does the whole thing and she's she's actually having a bit of a giggle and if you look at the doctor he's not having fun at all no that's that's rosie's character though isn't it? I, 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 know, I know but there's is it the the, the the director kind of should have gone you know if you are going to do that at least look at the doctor and drop the smile you know it, 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 it's it's one of those things it's, it's not I'm, I'm, it's a tiny tiny grain of, of, of a grain <laughs> but I mean out, out of all the all the episodes of Doctor Who that we get I think this is probably the most theatrical uh, episode like you you could imagine that as a stage show yeah, and, yeah I think, I, and I think you'd be able to pull it off I think you would be able to do it um, unlike other episodes of Doctor Who where, which would require great leaping uh, bounce, bounding sets <laughs> Whereas this one could work with a black cloth. Um, that's pretty much all I've got to say on this episode, really. I don't really have anything else, unless unless you've got anything else you'd like to add. No, I, I think we've covered it. I mean, um, let's try it. We've discussed the lighting. That was good. Um, um, we've got no, no stick-outs or points with the uh, music or the scoring of the episode. Uh <laughs> The only, thing, the only thing I would say, and I, I, I did touch on it slightly, is that the, the the other thing I would like to add on this is the editing. The editing builds this episode. Like, um, for example, uh, in the opening scene where the TARDIS lands, there are about 12 cuts between the time that they say um, this place is good food, good manners, and then all the shops open. And literally, it's cat, 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 cat. It's jumping all around the place to try to make the place busy and look busy, and it's all tight angles. If you think about it, if you think about that actual sequence, you're looking at the Doctor and Rose and Adam, then it cuts to the actual panel opening up, then it cuts again to all the, the, the people with, with all the pots and pans and stuff, then you got all the food going on, and close-up of this guy running back and forth, and... All these people come out of the out of these through these doors, and it's all in tight tight cuts. And we're talking one second, one and a half second per shot. It's very very tightly edited, and, and, and this episode is made in the edit. Like this is and this also is, again for the second week running, no TARDIS interior, no TARDIS interior, no no. Um, but it's yeah, this this episode is made in the edit and. Again, good scoring, good music. Uh, it's again, it's an episode I think gets overlooked because they're bigger and better episodes. And uh, you know, Dalek worked incredibly well because he did a plate of nostalgia as well. Let's let's not kid ourselves here. Dalek had nostalgia, the the, the Trump card there. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, whereas what happens with um. The empty child and the doctor dances is that it's much more epic scale this is neither nostalgic nor has epic scale in fact it's the, the least epic of any episode where it can't afford a ross drum where where the where the, where the fence posts aren't even bolted to the floor <laughs> it's you you know that it's a, it's a money saving episode but so I, I think it gets overlooked for all those reasons um I'm not sure it's unjustified because, again, it's not the best villain. Because, um, again, if, if you can just walk away from them, it's kind of like the Sarlacc. The Jagrafess is Doctor Who's Sarlacc pet, except it's up instead of dumb. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not very good, it's not very good uh, uh, as a villain. Um, but I think the story itself, the story it's trying to tell, which is saying, you know, uh, again, it's, it's be cautious in the media. Don't just accept everything on face value. Don't just accept what they say. Do your research. Have a look and you know, dig a little deeper. 
Uh, otherwise, look what can happen by, by slowly changing the facts over a period of time. You can end up in in real trouble because if you just accept the facts as as they go along without them being the actual facts, and I, I, you know, it's a cautionary tale. And I think I don't really know of many cautionary tales that Russell T Davis does. So, um, sorry guys, got to take a phone call. So bye, probably. Okay. Take care, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, a lot of this episode as well is um, is is setting up towards the finale as well because they're on Space Station Five, which yeah, happens to be the same yeah. space station that they was on at the end of the world. Um, so it links that together, and then it, you know, it it, it, it travels on. Uh, oh, down this the this is like very that. this this is very much the set of episode. Yeah, because we've had the previous episode with the Dalek, so this is now the episode that is literally they didn't mention Bad Bad Wolf. I don't think I don't think they, they I don't think it, yeah yes it was Bad Wolf Corporation. Yeah, he was, 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 was on the monitor. Yeah, Bad Wolf was definitely Bad Wolf TV is the name of one of the channels. Yes, that's the one by the um with the um face of Bob. Yeah. Um. But yeah, this is no setting up now for the finale. This this satellite station, because again, the room that they were in when they were doing looking over the Earth, is the room that Linda with the Y dies in. That's the room where where you see the Dalek arrive arrive out uh, outside the window. Um. So yeah, there's a there's a lot of things going on now. Again, when we talked about how the the Daleks have inserted the Jagrafest and the actual plot here, which is to they are now mining people and they're using these news stories to cover over the fact that these people are going missing. You know, we, as, a, as, a, as a backward thread, because obviously, like, if you imagine now, now Russell's right in this show, he's probably already, he's probably already got the finale in mind and is now pulling, th- pulling things, where can I pull this back to? And he's choosing little things to pull back to this episode, and not, not just this, this episode, but again, you've got um, stuff with Captain Jack that happens, you know, that he's already thought about for the revival of Captain Jack after this episode, uh, after he dies. So there's all this stuff that he, he's already got the season mapped already, but he's using this as a as a real big building block for what's going to happen in the finale, and he's sa- they're saving money now so that they can do it, do the well, as I said, with a line budget for the series, you budget the entire series as one big block. How much is all of this going to cost? And then divide it up between all the episodes. But then with this episode, then you go, well, we can save a bit of money here and I'll put this mon- this extra money into the next episode. So it still costs exactly the same amount. It's just your money saving here is co- is you spend it there. So it's, um, yeah. But as for the episode of series one of Doctor Who, for, for me, this is the one that's, that's the most familiar feeling of Doctor Who. Um, that's pretty much it, really. Yeah, uh, to, yeah, to sum up, it is. It does seem like an old Doctor Who episode. And um, because of it building towards the whole Bad Wolf story, um, it's also a lot more important of an episode than you initially think when you first watch it. Yeah, well, again, that, that's that's the key part, is that this this is a... I, I think if you were to take this episode out, I think there are a couple of things that you'd need to know. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't necessarily need to know them, but first of all, this is the episode that, that applies consequence to the Doctor's actions. So what the Doctor does sure has consequences for... Bad Wolf and part of the ways. Yeah. And it's the first time he's ever I, I've ever known a story whereby the doc's actual actions lead to a consequence. Because he arrived at Satellite 5 like several uh, like a hundred years later. And the earth has been trashed. You've got all these stupid games where, where people are, you know, grown force and all these things where, where people are, you know, getting ground up and killed and minced and and it's because the, the Daleks are now advancing their plans. So, 
Yeah, and they, they, I think they allude to that um, consequence with Adam. Yeah. They allude, you know, that there's consequences to your actions. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, all, it's all very cleverly woven together. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's, what, that's the best way to describe Series 1, really, because there's no... Uh, like, people talk about story arcs with Doctor Who, and there, there isn't really a story arc with Doctor Who for Series 1. They are pretty much self-contained episodes. There's a couple of double out, but the the whole thread of bad wolf it can mean anything yeah it's just it's just a mystery what is bad wolf it's just a mystery box it's not really a story arc we know you, know, you can watch this series in, in in any episodes in any order aside from the two partners and you're still going to come away with exactly the same sort of like story there's nothing you're not going to learn any anymore and um russell t davis does that again with uh the whole john saxon thread doesn't he yes does exactly the same thing, puts little bits here and there. It's just, it's just, it's just world building. Yeah. And again, well, that's the other thing that I thought was great with this episode was the fact that, as cheap as it was, and as as low tech and low budget as it was, the the world building stuff that they threw in, you know, the money, it's the silver bar thing that looks like a harmonica. Um, it's just all these weird little things, but these, these weird little ideas that they put in place. And some of them are silly ideas. But again, the silly ideas that you know at some point, somewhere, somebody could market it. You yeah. know? And um, anyway, that's all I've got on this episode. Yeah, I, I, I have nothing else. The costumes look good. Lighting looked good. Sound was good. Music was good. Effects, okay. Good for the time. Yeah, definitely good for the time. For a television program. Yeah. British one at that. So I think we're going to leave that there. And next week we're going to be doing Father's Day. Yes, we I, are. I believe. Yeah, is um, the next one on the list? Ah, uh, Father's Day again. It's the one. I, it's the one I could probably leave. Um, I, I don't, don't think I'm being. Um, am I being unfair on that? Well, it's I, another episode of uh, Consequences. It's a par- isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a paradox episode, isn't it? I'll tell you what, what what I liked with I might leave it for next week, but uh, one of the things I liked with um, the Father's Day episode was the fact that it did acknowledge what happens with the Doctor going back on his own timeline and yeah. why it's it's important that that doesn't happen. So um, that's because that really they haven't. There's always been a, a way around. There's always been a oh no, it's okay for the Doctor to do it because the Doctor knows what he's doing. So anytime the doctor's met the doctor or, or something like that, it's always been like, well, you know, timeline's gone out of sync, but you, and you won't remember this, but never mind. Whereas with Father's Day, it's a case of we really shouldn't be doing this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, it's kind of like the first time you get cause and effect in an episode. So I, it's got its pros and its cons, uh, I think. Um, well, that's pretty much it. Unless you've got any more, anything more to add, Chris? No, I think we've... we've... For, for the the scope of this episode, mm-hmm. I think we've uh, covered quite a lot considering <laughs> around here. Yeah, it's a, it's a very small episode, so yeah. Anyway, uh, so we're going to call our quits, and I think we're going to end the broadcast right there. So uh, hopefully, if you've uh, watched the long game with us, we, ironically, the long game is the shortest one we've done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and next week. Yeah, and ne- next week we're going to be doing the uh, paradoxical episode Father's Day, uh, where Rose is going to cock things up, I guess. So yeah, yeah um, can I get away of saying she's going to drop a bollock? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's what happens when the companion. I mean, she she kind of has leeway with the doctor, which Adam doesn't have, and uh, her her leeway. I, can't, I think she kind of stretches it to, to capacity. Uh, Just she, <laughs> she, Yeah. I mean, she, she almost like destroys the TARDIS and it, it's kind of like, you, you can do whatever you like to the Doctor, but don't do, don't, don't hurt the TARDIS. <laughs> anyway, hopefully you've had, uh, had a good time. I've had a good time. Yep, always nice. Um, and uh, yeah, next week is Father's Day, so take care and we'll see you then. Take care. Bye-bye.